Aloha. I'm Ku'uhiaku Jiang, and I'll be your host for this episode of Wailau. Mai, mai, e nānea mai ki a momo olelo o ke kaiaulu. Wailau is a series of themed storytelling events that breaks barriers and helps people in our community find a common ground and appreciation for each other while empowering members of our community to share their stories. Wailo is translated as the gathering of many waters, a place where water from diverse sources come together to become a more powerful, unified whole. Wailo forms a sense of belonging and common space for diverse ideas and people in our community through the power of storytelling. Now the theme of this episode is getting from point A to point B. Now we may automatically think of a physical journey when we hear about this, but as we'll see with today's stories, it may also refer to a metaphorical journey through life. Our topic expert for this episode is Desmond Antone Homer. Desmond was born in Hilo and raised in Keokaha and Puna. He is a member of the Royal Order of Kamehameha and the Polynesian Voyaging Society and has journeyed across oceans on the famous deep sea voyaging canoe, Hokulea. As a part of the Ohana Va'a, he has helped to educate many of Hawaii's keiki on the teaching canoe Makali'i, Hiapo Kealii Kai, and Kaihe Kawila. Kumu Wa'o Haumea has devoted decades to perpetuating Hawaiian culture and sharing those with succeeding generations. When he's not on the ocean, he serves Nakupuna as a member of the Hawaii Island Burial Council and Na Opio as an educational specialist with his Ba'a curriculum at Ka'umete Ka'eo, Mountain View Elementary School, and Waldorf Malamalama. He is also a Kumuao at Halo Moliola Medical as an indigenous traditional healer, executive chef, and cognitive behavioral therapist, and has tra traveled the world sharing his music and plays with the band Bamboo and Hemea Ho. Aside from that, he is married to Dr. Stacy Ho Mea, and they both have raised two keiki, Kukui and Temona Nuya Hiba, both attending UH Hilo. You know, um, this topic of getting from point A to, to point B, it's, uh, to, it, for me, it's a very Western-minded narrative. Um, listening to all these stories, how we went away from that, um, utilizing that as a tool, but as we progress through life, um, experiencing different things, changes in our lives, how that uh, plan, you know, from point A to point B changes constantly. And listening to, uh, to, uh, to these stories, uh, you, like, well, you want to take note of these key words like love, uh, the joy of the destiny, I mean, the voyage there, not really looking at point B setting your goals as a young adult going through school or experiencing uh, identity uh, who i am you know uh, where am i going um, and having uh, the parents playing an important role to that to that point a to point b point b uh, keeps changing uh, point a could be from when you were born being raised by the by the uh, your parents who wants to instill their values in you uh, as a voyaging person, uh, I think what's important to understand is the, the kaula. The kaula uh, constantly tugging <clears throat> on their lives and trying to pull them your way and only to find out later, you know, I think we should be sharing the kaula, or what they call the alkalines, the, the, this, this rope or this, this, this spiritual line that connects us all. And I think it's important to, to understand that concept that um, Love solves all. To be from Hawaii, to be blessed with the, the skill of aloha. I think we kind of put that on the side while we're trying to instill our own values. But in the end, as you listen to these stories, they've been finding their way and reaching that, that point B or C or D. It's important to know exactly where you are in your life. So it's, it's a good like uh said you know it's about this this struggles it's about this fun it's about this love this enjoyment that that you need to have that in your life so point a to point b very good concept but it doesn't really hold water because it keeps changing mahalo uncle des oh are you guys ready let's go wailau episode three starting with 
Bonnie Irwin with Getting Lost. Bonnie Irwin began serving as chancellor at the University of Hawaii at Hilo in July 2019. Before that, she served as provost and vice president for academic affairs at California State University, Monterey Bay. She also served as dean of the Honors College and then dean of the Honors Arts of Humanities at Eastern Illinois University. She started at Eastern Illinois University as a tenure track professor of English, specializing in world literature and folklore before moving into administration. Dr. Irwin has given dozens of presentations and led roundtables and panels at major higher education conferences on topics such as the role of honors, transforming campuses into centers of engagement, student success initiatives, including first year experience, student success in computer science, innovation in higher education, and open access colleges as a pathway to upward mobility. An expert on oral traditions and folklore, Dr. Irwin is the author of articles, book chapters, and reviews on these topics, and has also written several encyclopedia entries on women's and medieval folklore. She remains active in this field of study through writing, giving invited presentations, conducting workshops, and participating in distinguished lecture series. I like getting lost. Lost in time, lost in thought. I particularly like getting lost in a good book. But even when I get lost in physical space, as nerve wracking as that might be, I kind of like it, particularly when it's over. My parents and I were rock hounds. When I was a child, we would drive around the country looking for really unique specimens of rocks and minerals for our collection. Some would end up on a shelf, some would end up being made into a piece of jewelry. But what I really value about those times are the experiences I had with my parents. So on one fateful day, we found ourselves in Northern Michigan. The Upper Peninsula of Michigan, above Wisconsin, sticks out into Lake Superior. The largest of the Great Lakes, 31,000 square miles. When you're standing on the shore, you almost feel like you're at the ocean because you can't see the other side. And we'd had a good day. We found some cool pieces of copper and um, my father got it in his head that he wanted to get to the very tip of the peninsula, the part that stuck the furthest out into Lake Superior. So, okay, so dad's behind the wheel, mom has the map and we set out in a station wagon because of course there weren't SUVs at this time weren't cell phones either. And the road ends, but there's a little logging road. And my father says, well, I think if we take that, it'll, it'll take us to where we wanna go. It's like, okay. So we start driving and we drove some more and drove some more. On the map, it looked like it wasn't that far to the end of the road, to the end of the tip of the peninsula. But once we were driving, it just kept going. It started to get dark started to rain. The little girl in the back seat's getting a little nervous and saying, Dad, can we turn around? Oh, we're almost there, honey. Don't worry, we're almost there. And we drove and we drove. Eventually, my father had to admit defeat. Turned around, went back, got to the hotel. It's a lovely time. But my mother and I will always record this in the annals of Irwin family history as the day my father lost Lake Superior. Years later, he would say, you know, if we just drove a little bit further, I'm sure we would have been there. We kind of roll our eyes say, face it, Dad, you lost Lake Superior. Decades later, I was behind the wheel of a car, driving from Eastern Illinois University to Western Illinois University with a couple of my friends. We were going to give presentations at Western. And you would think that in the flattest state in the country, it would be pretty easy to get from point A to point B. But you know, in Illinois, all roads lead to Chicago. And so if you're trying to go across the state, not as easy as you might think. You might be on the freeway for a while, but then you gotta get off, little road here, little road there. And so we had maps, we set out, and as we're driving along, making turn after turn, little teeny roads, all of a sudden the road we're on dead ends in a cornfield. Of course, in Illinois, you're most likely to dead end in a cornfield. 
my friends are getting nervous. They're thinking about movies like Children of the Corn and what's going to come out and, and get us, right? Um, I just started laughing because like, well, you know, if my dad can lose Lake Superior, then I can get lost in a cornfield. So turn around, back out, get on another road, um, stop for a break in a little teeny town in the middle of Illinois called Assumption. Got back on the road. By this time, it's dark. We had to stop for dinner. And I started chuckling again. And my friends were like, what? It's dark. We're tired. This trip's taking longer than we thought. What's so funny? I said, I cannot wait to tell people that we got lost by assumption. And maybe it's good to assume we're lost. Because then maybe we're not lost at all. Just assume we're lost. Eh, we'll get there eventually. And so I try to approach road trips like that. 10 years later, my husband and I were in Hilo for our very first time. We were on vacation. I had made a reservation at the inn at Kulania Pia Falls. We had stopped for dinner and uh, it was dark, but I had a map, knew where we were going. And so we set out. There's an interesting thing about these experiences with me. They almost all take place partially in the dark. I'm not sure what that means. But we we're driving along and Mocha in Hilo at night is really, really dark. No street lights and the road went from two lanes to one. My husband kept asking, are you sure we're on the right road? Do you know where we're going? Because it really feels like we are driving to the end of the earth because we could see nothing. Just black sky, no moon that night. And it really felt like we were driving to the end of the world. Eventually there would be a little sign in this way. It's like, see, told you, we're on the right road. And then we get dark again and we would drive and drive. It probably wasn't very long in the end, but it seemed really long that night. We got to the inn, it was lovely. The falls were great. But what we remember about that trip is that feeling we had in the car that we were just driving to the end of the earth. Getting lost can be stressful. It can be embarrassing. It can make us late for things, but it's also an experience. If I can get a good story out of it, it's been worth it. And quality time with family and friends makes it all worthwhile. So yeah, I like getting lost. That was an interesting view, somewhat similar to uh, voyaging. It's the enjoyment of the voyage there and it, usually when we land or we reach our destination it's somewhat uh, sad yeah. because we go you know you create a family on the va'a right. and what happens is you have to say we hold goodbye you don't know when you're gonna see each other right 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 and see so, yeah, on, on the va'a as well you know um that's where the fun happens right and i'm not saying that the destination destination is not fun as, as well oh, but yeah, yeah. it's where you grow it's where you learn it's where you become yeah. ohana on that va'a yeah our next story is entitled, Getting from Point A to Point B, Lessons from the Mother Road, by Catherine Kalama Becker. Catherine is a associate professor of communication. When she was 18, she discovered her birth certificate was fake and that she was a black market adoptee. The following year, she set off on her motorcycle to find out who she was and where she belonged. Her forthcoming memoir, The Mother Road, A Black Market Baby, a motorcycle, a search for a reel across ununited states, documents her quest. To this day, she continues to explore the ways that communication intersects with who we are, the ways we relate to each other, and the natural world. While on her motorcycle trip, she rode through radioactive tailings from the Church Rock uranium mining spill on the Navajo Nation, the largest release of radioactive material in U.S. history. After returning to Buffalo, she des designed her own undergraduate major in Native American Studies and Public Relations to raise awareness about Indigenous issues and the environment. While in Hawaii, pursuing a graduate degree in American Studies, she was given the name Kalama. She collaborated with Patrick Ka'anoi, the author of The Need for Kauai, and Maori author Doya Narden, to create Mana Cards, The Power of Hawaiian Wisdom, to foster connection through Hawaiian symbols and stories. Sometimes we're so focused on getting from point A to point B, 
we find ourselves on a wild goose chase. That's what happened to me. When I was 18, I found out my birth certificate was a fake and that I was a black market baby. I left the industrial, recessed, depressed hellhole of Buffalo, New York on my punk and orange Honda 400 and rode 9,000 miles across the United States searching for my birth mother. I'd always known I was adopted, but whenever I asked my mother about my other mother, all she would ever say is, I'm your only mother. So out of respect for my adopted parents, I waited till I was 18 to search. Back then, New York State was a closed record state, which meant adoptees, even when they become adults, could not gain access to their records. So I joined a support group for adoptees and birth parents who were searching. When I walked into the meeting, upon giving my introduction and sharing all I knew about my history, my birth date, the name of the hospital where I was born, and the name of the lawyer who handled my adoption, the woman who was running the meeting said, it looks like we have another black market baby. She went on to explain that the lawyer had been indicted by the Senate for baby selling and that they had suspected he was part of a ring operating out of the hospital. She said that the only way that I would ever find out anything about who I was or my history would be if I could gain access to my original birth certificate, which was likely to have been shredded. I felt like I was shredded. So when, when I went home, I confronted my parents demanding my original birth certificate. They denied having any such document. But the following day, when I went into the kitchen with, for my bowl of Lucky Charms, there it was on the kitchen table where they left it for me to find. The birth date was the same, but the name was not. Instead of saying Catherine Becker, in quotes were the words infant, followed by what must have been my original last name. But I couldn't make it out. The name had been scratched out in lines of blue ink. Lines like the ones my mother always put on my birthday cards under the words happy and birthday and love and your and mother. But when I held it up to the light, I could make out the letters K-R-O-H-M-E-R. -E the name was unusual. Good. That meant there'd be less of them in the phone book. But when I checked the heaving Buffalo directory, there were none. Back in the 1980s, the only search engine was on my motorcycle. So I rode it around the country, checking phone books along the way for somebody named Cromer in hopes that I'd find my natural mother. I didn't find my natural mother on that trip, but I did connect to mother nature and the ocean. But I longed to connect to the rest of humanity. I longed to sit in a circle of women and say, I am daughter of so-and-so, daughter of so-and-so, daughter of so-and-so as far back as memory goes. So I decided that if I couldn't trace my lineage backwards, I'd cast it forward by having a daughter of my own. I'd raise her close to the ocean and close to mother nature. So I moved to Hawaii and became a mother. But motherhood often takes us places we never expected to go. By becoming a mother, I gained compassion for the, for the challenges of both my adopted and my birth mother. But at 15, my child, came out as trans and non-binary. All these years, I thought that having a daughter would weave myself back into the lay of humanity. Then this. Detour. I'm a person who pays attention to signs, whether they're by the side of the road, in the sky, or they're coming through oracles. And I needed insight. So I practiced a form of divination that involves opening a book to any page and looking at its words for a message. I took a dictionary and opened to the word line, allowing its associations to carry me. Line, a point in motion, a system of transportation, a circuit of power, a row of horizontal characters on a page, a state of control, a set of waves, a chord, a family, a calling, an action, a story, an insight, to come to correct relative position. To come to correct relative position, I held the consent form that my child asked me to sign for hormone therapy up to the light. Just like I did my original birth certificate all those years ago. It glares at me, hungry for my signature. 
I consider the power that paper and pens have in our lives. With one swipe, an identity can be crossed out or restored. I wielded the pen in my hand like a sword, and I signed the form. If the agony of the betrayal of my adoption has taught me anything, it has taught me that we cannot make another into who we want them to be. We must acknowledge who they are. People are not destinations. We don't heal by forcing others into the shape of our gaping wounds. We heal by loving others and ourselves unconditionally. For love is not a line that goes from A to B. Love is a circle. Wow, um, mahalo Professor Becker for sharing your story with us. Um, you know, I have to agree that I think we all have to be reminded constantly to not impose our own ideologies on others, but to accept them and to see them as who they are and to watch them grow into who they could be. So definitely I, I took that from there. So mahalo um, Beck, um, Professor Becker. How about you, Uncle? Right. Do you hear that story? It's, uh how long has it been going on? There's a lot of children that suffer from that. Mm -hmm. And that, that bothers me that, you know, we cannot be open enough to accept changes. Right. And then parents like Makua of himself or any, anybody in yeah. that position has that power, the kuleana, yes, to right. take the pen that was used against them and to rewrite the story yeah. for their children or to help write that story for their children so that they right. are not hurt by what they have gone through as well. Like what Becker said, yeah. Yeah, the kulian of the kaula, yeah. Mm. You know, as they're growing and as a parent now, <clears throat> you know, I find it out that I was trying to hang on to the kaula too much instead of offering it to my children. Mm. Help me pull what you want to do, what your decisions in life, what, what directions you're going to follow. Right. You know, rather than, you know, only if later on as they get, in, you know, as they mature and I find out, you know, I got to let them grow on their own. You know, I planted the seed, we nurture in it. As time goes by, and you just add water. Our next story is entitled, The Journey is the Reward by John Sakurai Horita. John was born and raised in Hilo. After high school, he attended university and graduate school on the continent. He then started his career and remained there for the next 40 years. Five years ago, he returned to Hilo to retire but got bored with the retirement and found a position at UH Hilo as a career advisor in the advising center. The COVID pandemic hit and in 2020, John decided to give retirement another try. His journey from point A to point B has definitely been filled with new adventures, changes, challenges, and some disappointments. John has used his own story to advise students to have a plan to get from point A to point B but to not be locked into that plan. Point B will constantly change throughout that plan. John's point B is still out there and he's still enjoying the journey. What are you gonna be when you grow up? What are you gonna do next? These questions have been around since the beginning of time. Your parents, grandparents, teachers, counselors, neighbors and friends all wanna know most of them out of concern for you, but some out of pure nosiness. Being a university career advisor for the past several decades, I have asked these questions of students myself, not so much to lock them into a plan, but to have them start thinking about a direction they might wanna go in, cautioning them that this direction will probably change, this plan will probably change, and point B will probably change. The journey from point A to point B is never a straight line. It's filled with twists and turns and new adventures and some barriers that you have to get over, around, and through in order to get closer to point B. When I was in high school, I had a plan. I did well in my math classes and I loved, and I still do, Love the logic of math equations and math functions. I had a math teacher who was tough, but he showed me that math can be fun and can be interesting. And so I started out as a math major in college. My plan B or point B was to graduate with a degree in math, do some research 
and branch off into some other scientific endeavor. I thought this was my plan B and that this is what I was going to do the rest of my life. I thought I'd be happy in Nerdvana. Unfortunately, this all changed after three semesters of calculus. I was on the fourth page of my solution discussion when I really had to ask myself, is this what you want to do the rest of your life? And my answer was absolutely not. My major jumped around after that. Education, sociology, psychology, double major in sociology and psychology, experimental psychology. Four years went quickly and I had to graduate. I had to make a decision. You see, when I was in college, the Vietnam conflict was in, in, in place. I was on a student deferment for four years and I had a low draft number. My assumption was that I was going to graduate and get drafted right away. Now, although there were many reasons for me not to get involved in the Vietnam conflict, but that's a whole nother story for another day, my assumption was that I'd go into the service, serve my two years, get out, and then decide what to do, decide what point B was going to be at that stage of my life. Well, the draft ended the year I graduated from college. And so I quickly had to come up with a plan. I quickly had to figure out what is point B going to be now. Well, graduate school seemed to be a good option. And so I went to get my master's in social work. And my point B was going to be to become a social worker and save the world. Well, five years later, I decided to go back to graduate school to become a university counselor, my new point B. While doing that, I became interested in and changed my point B to career counseling. I graduated, and after a few years of career counseling, I started to move up the university structure and decided that I would get an advanced degree in university administration. Went back for that degree and my point B at that point became being an administrator at that university. I thought I would finish out my career at that university and be happy the rest of my life. Well, after 10 years as a director at the university, I left the university and started my own consulting practice. I started a few other businesses along the way, and point B changed a lot during those years. Well, in 2016, I decided it was time to retire. I returned to Hilo after living on the mainland for 40 years. I had gone through a lot of point Bs over my lifetime, but I thought it was time to just sit back and relax. <laughs> well, that lasted for about six months and I got totally bored. And so luckily, I got a position as the career advisor at University of Hawaii at Hilo. My point B at that point was to revitalize career services for all UH students. I was in the position for two and a half years and then COVID hit which changed point B for many of us. Now, I had used my story many times in counseling students, not so much to point out the importance of having a plan, but also the importance of paying attention to the changes, to the twists and turns, and some of the barriers that you have to overcome. On the surface, my journey from point A to current is confusing. And I must admit, I was confused at times. My journey seems frustrating. And there were many frustrating nights where I had to ask myself, what are you doing? Why did you make that decision? And my journey seems difficult. And believe me, there were many sleepless nights and depressing days. 
But I don't regret any of that. I don't regret any of the twists, the turns, the barriers that I had to overcome because it was all part of my journey. In fact, my journey is not done at this point. In fact, point B is as fluent as it was when I was 18 years old. I learned a long time ago that reaching point B is not as important as getting to point B. Steve Jobs, in describing the early days of Apple Computer, used a ancient Chinese proverb that says, the journey is the reward. Some people actually reach point B, which is great. But my hope is that everyone, whether you reach point B or don't reach point B, that you enjoy the success of your journey from point A to point B. Thank you for listening to my journey. Part of that, that story that John um, shared is what I got from it was that point B constantly changes. Yep. And the, the point B in our head is not the reality of our destination. That often, probably most, most often, like every time, mm -hmm. right? Um, and it speaks volumes, at least for me as a, a, a young Hawaiian who is venturing out into the world, going to yes, graduate pretty exactly. soon. And um, I, you know, I have a, these goals that I want to hit, right? But I think the story that John shared, it really does um, make me reflect on it's okay, you know, if, if your B changes here and there, it's again, mm -hmm. it's all about that journey that towards wherever that B may be. Yeah. And for you to be where you are today, I've known you for a long time, for you and baby time. Yeah. You know, it's never a straight line. It's never a straight line. Mm -hmm. And you know, John and I are classmates. Um, we're uh, considered road runners and he, he hit the nail right on the head. Uh, it's that destination, like in voyaging, in life itself, just trying to figure things out. Uh, and like I said earlier, everything keeps changing. You wake mm -hmm. up the next day, things keep changing. So you need to adjust. Um, um, as a voyager learning from Papa Mao, um, he has a quote that stays with me today that I share with my students a lot. And he says, you cannot do anything but the wind, but mm. you can surely adjust your sails. Our next story is entitled Embracing Opportunity by Nikki Gore. Nikki began her career as a performing artist at the age of 11. The performing bug bit her and never let go. From Anaheim to San Francisco, California, she has performed, directed, and crewed in various stage productions. After receiving her bachelor's in anthropology and a minor in education at San Francisco State University, Nikki developed and implemented an after-school theater arts program at the YMCA at San Francisco. Since moving to Hawaii Island in 2014, she has worn a lot of different hats, but currently she is a business marketing consultant for Resonate Hawaii Radio Group, and the morning show drive time host for the Wave and 92 FM. She mostly survives off of bread, butter, cheese, and homemade kale chips. Mm. Go ahead, Nikki. I've been journaling my entire life. When I was in third grade, my Winnie the Pooh diary was filled with stories about my then boyfriend who had given me on Valentine's Day a mug that had a cartoon dog on it that said, I woof you. We were destined to be together forever. When I was 19 and I was running wildly around Paris, I had attempted to journal completely en français. When I look back now, I have a very vague recollection as to what actually happened during those two years. But when I was 22, the way I journal changed. You see, I'd seen this interview with Elizabeth Gilbert, the author of Eat, Pray, Love, and she talked about journaling in a way that you kind of manifest your future. And it went like this. Every day you write three statements. The first, a mantra for yourself. The second, something that you really, really, really want. Because if you really want something, you need to really, really, really want it. And the third was your happiest moment of the day. So I decided to give this a try, and shortly after giving it a shot, I started noticing 
the way different opportunities started presenting themselves to me. For example, that first year, I was buried to my neck in student loan debt, and I really, really, really needed to find a way to actually manage it. I wrote it down, and poof, I met a new friend who was a financial advisor, and he offered to help me come up with like an actual plan to get myself out of debt. At the time, I was also working for the YMCA doing corporate membership, and I loved the organization. I believed in the organization, but I wanted to be doing something I was actually passionate about, and bonus if it was in the arts. I wrote it down, and poof, I was offered a brand new position to develop and implement a theater arts after school program for the YMCA. A little while later, I decided it was time to leave San Francisco and I wanted to kind of go travel and check out a few places that were on my list of places that I may want to move to. And Kailua Kona was on that list. And in my room, I had this like cash box that had different envelopes. So one envelope had rent and another envelope had student loan debt and another envelope had my Hawaii fund because essentially I just wanted to be able to run around for three months, not worry about money, nanny, farm, and see if I really vibed with Kona. And one morning I'm sitting there and I'm counting the cash in my Hawaii fund and I say to myself, if I just had 100 more dollars, I would book my plane ticket today and make this dream a reality. So I wrote it down. I really, really, really want 100 more dollars outside of my regular income so I can book my plane ticket to Hawaii. Closed my journal, went to the grocery store, went on about my day. Now, this was the time in life when self-checkout machines were first hitting the scene at major grocery stores. I was super against self-checkout machines. They were robots taking people's jobs. This was the downfall of civilization in my eyes. But this particular day, the only human line had this dude who was kind of a creep and I just wasn't in the mood to deal with his jabroniness. So I broke my vow and I went to the self-checkout machine scanned my items, put a $20 bill into the machine, and it spat back out my change. I was supposed to get back like $4 and some change. I start to like gather my stuff and there's this huge line forming behind me. And I'm like, oh my gosh, nobody else wants to deal with jabroni pants. I gotta get out of here. So I just kind of leave in a hurry. And after I get outside, I decide to collect myself and reorganize. And in my hand, I am holding three $1 bills and one $100 bill. What are you supposed to do in this situation? Like, is this a divine sign from the universe deeming greater purpose? Or is it thievery? Even though the thievery was unintentional, but thievery nonetheless, and could potentially bring like really, really, really bad karma down the line. Um, I decided greater purpose went home and booked my plane ticket to Hawaii and I've been here now for seven years. And in the past seven years, I've continued to journal in the same manner. Mantra, really, really, really want in happiest moment. And it hasn't always been easy and everything and nothing has gone according to plan. But I am so thankful for that one moment that brought me here and has brought me opportunity and amazing people in my life. And a couple of years ago, I was thinking back on that one moment and decided, you know what, I'm gonna come clean and I'm going to write the major grocery store chain and I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell them what's up and send them a hundred dollar check and let them know my story. And surprisingly, they actually wrote me back and sent me a $100 gift certificate to any of their stores saying, it's okay. My conscience was cleared. I was so excited. I was like, I'm going to celebrate this. So I ran straight to the store, loaded up, went to the human line, and it was there that everything was laid out clearly to me when it said, gift certificate not valid in the state of Hawaii. <laughs>
<laughs> that was great. That was good. Mahalo, Nikki, for sharing your story. Um, I, I think from the get-go, the, the first thing I think about is um, how intention, you know, mm -hmm. can really open up new doors unintentionally. Mm -hmm. And also something that I got from that as well was that $100 bill mm -hmm. and how it just deterred her from, I guess, where she thought she was going to go, was, which, which was point B, right? But that $100 just... Got her closer. Got her closer to where she was supposed yeah, to be, right? Exactly. And it, it's such a... It's funny how life works, you know, like that. You know, um, for that's, that was a very spiritual moment. Right, yeah. And you don't have to be religious to feel the spirituality in that. Uh, whether you believe in God or you know, it's it it's that positive energy mm. that entered your 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 time and your space to you know, you might call it luck, mm. you know, something you planned for, but I think that it's a very spiritual moment. I mean, look what her plan B was or her destination was, you know, you spoke of that and it got her even closer yet. I mean, right, that's yeah. true blessings right there at, at numerous levels too, however you want to accept that, but Mm -hmm. That was a good story. That was great. Yeah. I wish I can find a hundred dollar bills <laughs> in a parking lot. As a I'm college go looking now. <laughs> as a college student, oh, that was a, a, yeah, a exactly. dream for me right here. <laughs> Whew. Guys, can you guys believe it? We're on our final story. Let's go. Our final story is entitled Puzzle Pieces by Tori Matsumoto. Tori is a freshman English major at UA Chilo, though she'd love to minor in journalism or Japanese language as well. Nothing's ever set in stone, but her current goal is to work in newspapers or broadcasting, focusing on women empowerment, LGBTQIA rights, and environmental activism. Today's world is one in which a monumental portion of our safety, respect, and societal worth is based on the color of your skin, thickness of your wallet, length of your, of your clothes, etc. She'd like to help change it into one that doesn't discriminate against one for existing, for being human. She says, who knows? Maybe my tiny 17-year-old voice would do some good. Go ahead, Tori. I have the attention span of a plastic spoon, so drafting the story was a strange process, to say the least. It involved a lot of pacing back and forth across my living room, spontaneous dance breaks in the kitchen, and lying on my bedroom floor, willing my Christmas lights to make some sort of sense out of my brain. Now, most of this was written from speaking my thoughts aloud, emptying my mind out into the open air for nobody but myself. If I'm being honest, point A to point B never really made sense to me. I didn't quite get how there could be a definitive start or end to anything, you know? How do you pin down the plot points of your journey, especially if it happened entirely inside your own head? How do you decide the climax of your story when you're still living in it? The only topics I was previously considering were stuff like my coming out, a battle with my self-worth, stuff like that, but they didn't seem right. They're important to me, of course, but what I really wanted to discuss was how all point A's and point B's, all milestones, if you will, big and small, are connected. Let's start with something simple. Point A, I went to a gloomy little baby shower back in the third grade. Point B, there I met my best friend of 10 years in a rapidly flooding bouncy castle. A, that friend encouraged me to check out a rather rambunctious group of actors at school. B, there I ended up discovering my passions for technical theater, piano, and songwriting. A, one of the techies pulled me aside and hugged me for what I thought was zero reason. And finally, B, thanks to that seemingly tiny gesture, I'm almost two years clean now. I'll put a rain check on this analysis to avoid dragging on forever, but you get the gist of it. I realize that every time I try to come up with a new point A and point B for this story, they fit together with the last ones like puzzle pieces. Some were harder to match than with others, but they intertwine nonetheless. It was this one big timeline of experiences, this weird little girl evolving with each one, and the most recent point B was me now. But that got me thinking. If every point A leads to a point B, and every point B becomes a point A building up to another point B, then when does it all end? When can I stop reinventing myself over and over for currently unattainable things, this never-ending loop of fleeting satisfaction before inevitably craving and grasping for more? When can I quit repeating one more year, month, day, breath, chance? 
this subconscious mantra ricocheting inside my head that's prompting, urging, pleading with me to keep searching for something that I know will never be enough. When can I just stand still for the first time in years and say, Tori, you did good. That's not exactly a stellar mindset for a 17 year old to have, I'll admit. However, one of my point B's from high school was me realizing that I'm tired of mellowing down my thoughts and emotions to better fit a society that's not accustomed to expressing them exactly how they're felt. So here I am, a jumbled mess of open phrases and loose threads that I myself don't even understand half the time, and that's okay, because you know what? Maybe the whole reason for reflecting upon your point A's and point B's is that you don't understand them and likely never will. None of us truly see that a point A has started, nor that a point B has just been reached until after it's all said and done. We become so incredibly fixated on conforming to society's predetermined peer pressured milestones on schedule that we place who they want us to be far above who we actually are. We overexert ourselves both physically and emotionally for people we may not even know, subduing our smiles because beauty is pain and there's nothing worse than falling behind and showing others a flawed, less beautiful version of you. Even if that perfect person wasn't you at all. But this feeling, this constant need to race against an indeterminate clock, it's normal, right? Isn't the awareness of the sphere just another point A? Hmm, just another point A. I guess that's when it clicked for me, staring at the glow in the dark stars on my ceiling and still talking to myself. I finally understood what I wanted the term point A to point B to truly mean. Now, I want point A's and point B's to be moments we simply look back on and not ones we work ourselves to the bone to fit. It's crucial to set realistic and healthy goals, but also not to obsess over them and forget to cherish all of the amazing things we are, do, and already have done so far. We shouldn't be so terrified of messing up a potential point A that we don't even try in the first place. And if something does become a point A and point B, we'll know with time. But for now, all we can do is be the kindest, most self-driven people we can from day to day and trust that our puzzle will fall into place as we go. And if you made it this far, I can't thank you enough for your time, for being here. Thank you for listening to me ramble, for being on this earth, being yourself. Thank you for continuing your puzzle, no matter what kinds of point A's and point B's are to come. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Mahalo Nui, Tori, for, for sharing that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I really resonated with this because, you know, just like Tori, I'm also a college student and in, in that time in my life where, you know, I'm just kind of trying to find my way. Mm -hmm. And like how Tori said, for some reason, every single time she reaches a point B, it becomes a point A and it just yeah. guides her another way. And I understand the frustration because you thought that you re reached your destination, but it just was another stepping stone to your actual destination. Mm -hmm. um, and I really love the point that she made where we should use that point A, point B structure mm -hmm. as it, a way to structure your life and Setting all. Setting goals. But, and right, but we shouldn't use it as a definition uh, to yeah. define Agreed. our failures in the past, yeah. right? Yeah. We should use it as a way to like, it's like a picture frame. Right. This is what happened in the past but we shouldn't use it to define who we are as a person right. and, and our, our own success. Yeah. Exactly. You know, this is point A to point B, and she said, I like what she said when uh, she said, A is starting again. Mm. You know, you finish one phase of your life. Mm. You know, do you continue that? But no, I, she said, no, I'm starting A again. So it's a new voyage, a new venture in your life. And that's why I said, you know, where are you? A to B, you're at C, you're at D now. Mm. But you know, like you said, you're a college student and it keeps changing. Mm -hmm. Every waking moment, it changes. So I like that she said, oh, you have to start, start A again, which to me is really good because, okay, I'm done with that. Mm -hmm. I'm on a new journey now. So that's, I like that, my Kai. Mahalo, mahalo, thank you. We would like to take this opportunity to thank Desmond Haumil for being our topic expert for this episode, as well as our five storytellers, Bonnie Oren, Catherine Becker, John Sakurai, Harita, Nikki Gore, and Tori Matsumoto. A special shout out goes to our sponsors, UH Hilo's Performing Arts Center, Mookini Library, and the UH Hilo English Club for their support in making this show possible. Do you have a great story to share? 
Tell the world at Wailo. Visit our website at hilo.hawaii.edu slash Wailo for more information about the next Wailo theme and how you could apply to be a storyteller. Selected stories will be aired in the spring of 2022. From all of us here at Wailo, we say aloha and ahui ho.